Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come before you and we do hold you high, Lord. We do hold your son, Jesus Christ, high. And we are so thankful that today we get to come and on a weekend that we get to celebrate freedom for our country, Lord, that we get to also talk about the freedom that we have in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, just like we don't want to celebrate that freedom only one day a year here in this country, Lord, would we not forget the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ and would we let it affect us and change our lives on a daily basis? Lord, I just pray that you would uh, you'd be with us as a congregation, that you would prep our hearts, you would prep our minds for the message, Lord, that you would push me out of the way so that your Holy Spirit could work. And Lord, that only what you want to be said would be said today and that anything that's of me, Lord, that you just remove it. Lord, we just lift you up and we praise you in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Children, you are dismissed. As Pastor Bill would say, be kind to your teachers. We are going to be in Galatians chapter number five this morning. Galatians chapter number five is where we're going to be at. It is indeed 4th of July weekend. Happy 4th of July. We are a free nation. That is something to be excited about. And in, yeah, I agree. That is something to be excited about. On July 8, 1776, the first public readings of the Declaration of Independence were given in Philadelphia Independence Square. And just about one year later, on July 4th, 1777, is when Independence Day was marked. And it was marked with bonfire, fireworks, music, and celebration. And now we celebrate that once a year. We celebrate our freedom. We celebrate our independence. We celebrate our liberty. And we do that once a year, but the reality is, is we live in that every single day. And it's easy for us to remember that, but sometimes it's not so easy for us to remember and celebrate our Christian freedom. When Pastor Bill decided to take a couple weeks off to get some recharging and take a vacation, which, by the way, hi, Pastor Bill, glad to have you on uh, live stream. <laughs> when he decided to take some time off, he asked me to give a message out of Galatians chapter number five, which is oftentimes referred to as one of the best passages that discusses our Christian freedom. It's something that we can go through and understand and be reminded of and something we shouldn't forget because as we get to celebrate our freedom of speech and freedom religion here today at Hope, we want to be able to celebrate our Christian freedom on a regular basis. Now, we're going to be in Galatians chapter number five, but jumping into the middle of a letter is kind of tough. So let me give you some background on where we're at in Galatians so that this makes sense. The letter of Galatians was written by Paul. Paul wrote it to the churches of Galatia. There's four or five churches that were believed to be a part of this group. Iconium, Lystra, Derby, Antioch, just a few of the churches that we're pretty sure were a part of this group that this letter was written to. And it was, it was written because at the time, these were Gentile churches, churches that were not Jewish in nature. Paul had brought the gospel to these churches, had established these churches, and they weren't Jewish, which meant they didn't have Jewish rituals. They didn't have Jewish practices in place. They didn't have the Jewish festivals. They were not Jews. They were Gentile believers. Well, Jew te Jewish teachers and preachers went into these churches and started telling these people that in order for you to be actually saved, you need to be circumcised and you need to follow the Jewish law. Paul wrote this letter to fight just that thought and to get to the heart of what really is our salvation, and that's Jesus Christ. So Paul writes this letter, and we begin in verse number one of chapter five in Galatians. And it says this, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And you're gonna hear the term freedom a lot today. The title of the message is freedom in Christ. And the big idea that we have today is that Christian freedom is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Amen. Christian freedom is found in Christ and in Christ alone alone. And we really see that right away in the very first verse of this chapter where it says, for freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Now, it's been said that this verse perfectly sums up this letter. It perfectly illustrates what this letter actually stands for. And it's the freedom that we have in Christ and in Christ alone. And as we start reading through this passage through the next 14 verses, finishing up in verse 15, we start to see four urgent warnings that Paul gives us concerning our Christian freedom. And the first urgent warning we get 
is stand firm in your freedom. Now, I was really moved when I studied this message for sure, but specifically this one verse. There's a whole sermon that can be taught on this one verse. But really, and don't overlook this verse either, I should say that. Don't overlook this and don't let the speed at which I teach overlook this passage or diminish this verse. In fact, highlight it, circle it, underline it, bookmark it in your Bible, go back to it and study this verse because it is a deep, deep verse theologically. Christ has set us free for freedom. What does this mean? Well, this is referring to Jesus Christ and his fulfillment of the gospel. And if you're here today and you're new or you've only been coming a few weeks or maybe you've been here for several times, but you don't understand why we get so excited to get in this room and lift our hands and praise Jesus. And we do this every week and it's like a, a mini celebration. And we do this, if that confuses you or you're not sure why we do this, and let me take the next couple minutes to try to explain it as best I can. You see, God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis. We read that, that God created the heavens and the earth. He didn't just create that. He created man and woman, and he created them perfect. The relationship with God and man was perfect. Meaning, they were talking in a, in a face-to-face like man. They were, they were talking directly to God on a daily basis. They were experiencing a full relationship with God on a daily basis that was much more personal than you and I can experience today that we, we, have to, we go through the Holy Spirit. We do have a relationship with God, but then they were talking directly with God. Then in Genesis chapter number three, sin entered into the world. Adam and Eve decided to uh, directly disobey an order from God. Sin entered into the world. And because of that sin, judgment had to come. Now, this is where a lot of people that are not believers or don't understand Christ or don't know Christ, this is where I lose them, right? Well, why in the world would a loving God be so judgmental? That's a fair question. That's a very fair question. And it's a question that we had to answer just a few weeks ago in our youth classes uh, as we teach them over at Mercury Minds, because we're going through Genesis and we hit the story of Noah. There's not a whole lot better picture or vision of what judgment is, right? I mean, Noah is the, is the story of God wiping out the whole earth with a worldwide flood. That's judgment. And as I was studying for this and trying to explain to the, to the students, hey, this is why judgment is needed, I ran across a, a quote by Skip Heitzig that we're going to see on the screen. It says, if God does not judge, then he is not just. If he is not just, then he is not perfect. And if he is not perfect, then he is not God. And that is the reality. That is the reality. See, sin came into the world through one man. We read that in Romans chapter number five, verse 12. It says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. See, Sin came through Adam and Eve, but because of that, we now are under that sin. We are in that world of sin. We live in that. That's our lifestyle. That's who we are. And because of that, and because God is a perfect and just God, we must go through judgment. And that judgment is actually a death, not only a death of this body, but a continual death of our soul in the afterlife when we are condemned to hell. That is, that is the punishment. That is the just punishment for our sin. We can't have a relationship that is direct with God anymore. This is where we are at because we have chosen sin over God. But as we heard in the song today, and as we read in Ephesians chapter number four, before this ever happened, before any of this happened, before the world was ever created, God had a solution in Jesus Christ. It says before the foundations of the earth, Christ was our solution. Christ was the plan. Jesus Christ was the answer. See, Jesus Christ came and he lived a perfect life. He fulfilled the law and the prophets. He did everything that needed to be done to write the check to pay off our sin balance. He was brutally murdered. He was put on a cross and he died, but he didn't stay dead. He rose again on the third day, thus proving that he was, he is, and he forever will be the God that he claimed to be which gives us our freedom. This is why we get together every Sunday morning. 
This is why we get together and worship God because it is through the sacrifice of Jesus. And when we repent from our sins and turn from that and turn to Jesus, we experience a full relationship with God again. We experience forgiveness of our sins. We can experience heaven for eternity. We experience freedom. The very freedom that we're about to talk about or finish talking about today. We are free. Some of you are sitting there saying, all right, I'm following but free, free from what? I mean, if you're free from something, that means you were bound to something before, right? You can't be free from something that you were never bound to. That's a good observation. And you know, our text actually points this out. If we read in verse number one, we see stand firm therefore and, don't miss the coordinating conjunction there that ties two phrases together. Stand, there, stand firm therefore and, do not submit again, another key word, again to the yoke of slavery. Man, I really get excited about this verse. I'm telling you, if I was, you know, John Piper would probably make three or four sermons out of this, all right? But there's definitely at least one sermon in this verse, okay? For, for, for freedom, Christ has set us free. But what has he set us free from? Well, we keep reading on and we see that we should stand firm in that freedom, and we shouldn't submit again to the yoke of slavery. There it is, folks. Pay attention, the yoke of slavery, that's what Jesus came to set us free from. That's exactly what he set us free from, is the yoke. Well, what is this yoke of slavery? What are we talking about here? Well, we talked about a yoke several weeks ago and the fact that it goes across the back of an ox and it restrains them, constricts them. It doesn't allow them to travel under their own free will. It pushes them in a direction. It controls their very outcome. And this yoke that they're talking about here is actually the yoke of the law or the yoke of our flesh, the yoke of our sin. That's the yoke that we have. That's the yoke that we were enslaved to before Christ. But not only the law, you see, before Christ, we were ruled by our flesh. Christ has set us free from the law, from the tyranny of the law, from the sin and guilt that we carry, freedom from the penalty, the presence, and the power of sin. Paul is telling the churches in Galatia to not return to this yoke of slavery. Stand firm. Why is he saying stand firm? Because your tendency is to go back to the law. That's your tendency. Otherwise, there would be no, way to, there'd be no reason to warn us to stand firm. Stand firm in your freedom. Warren Wearsby describes it this way. He says, the unsaved person wears a yoke of sin. The religious legalist wears the yoke of bondage. But the Christian who depends on God's grace wears the liberating yoke of Christ. Now, there's so much I could cover here, but for the sake of time, we have to move on to our next command. See, when we understand that we are free because of what Christ did for us, when we understand the weight of the sin that we have lived under before Christ, and when we recognize our first warning to stand firm, we also see our second urgent warning, which is to stop adding to the cross. Let's look back at verse number two. It says, look, I, Paul, I say to you, if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. See, the picture of yoke of the yoke starts to become clear as we unpack these verses. See, these churches in Galatia had Jewish teachers that were going in and telling them, if you want to be saved, you need to be circumcised. Paul's response to this is like, hey, look me, Paul, Paul, I'm a circumcised Jew. If there's anyone that should be preaching pro-circumcision, it's me because I'm a Jew. But I'm telling you, if you accept circumcision, Christ is of no advantage. Amen. Circumcision means nothing. And actually, this was covered in Acts chapter 15 at the Jerusalem Council, where some of our very early church fathers met together to discuss this very topic on how the law works with grace. The work of Christ supersedes the need to live under the law anymore. It is no longer a binding contract between God and his people. We are either his people because we have received the work that his son did for us, or we are not his people because we haven't turned from our sin and entered into a loving relationship with God by the power of his son's sacrifice. No longer are we judged by the law of lo alone, and thank God this is the case because the law condemns. The law is an unattainable standard. And this is exactly what Paul is getting at when he starts talking about circumcision. 
He is warning the churches in Galatia to not turn back to circumcision, to not turn back to the law as their salvation. For all time, it had been, hey, we need to live by the law. That is our salvation. And Paul's saying, don't turn back. The power of the blood is enough. The power of Christ is enough. The power of the sacrifice is enough. God doesn't look at his people anymore and see sin and have to respond in judgment. God looks at his people and sees his son, Jesus Christ. And he sees us as his sons and daughters. See, what Paul is speaking to a to a problem that is still present in this current day and age. The idea that we must do something to gain our salvation. The idea that salvation is earned through works. Or the idea that we must do something to maintain our salvation with God. And while most of us in here would disagree with that theology outwardly, our actions sometimes speak differently. See, what Paul is really speaking against here is legalism. This is an anti-legalism passage of scripture. See, legalism adds to the work of Christ. Legalism adds to the cross. Legalism implies that the cross and the sacrifice of Christ was not enough and that we must add to it in order to make it whole. Legalism puts the responsibility of us as fallen humans to find our own salvation or to keep our standing with God. And this is what is going on at the church of Galatia. The false teachers were telling them they couldn't truly be saved without circumcision. Legalism had set in. And while we can't really relate to this type, the specific type of legalism today in our church, right? I mean, this isn't a problem in our church. Um, We can relate to legalism in other ways. There are other areas of our Christian walk that we apply to salvation, whether directly or indirectly. And I've put together a quick list for us to just look at. Our Christian to-do list. I have to get baptized. I have to read my Bible daily. I have to pray regularly. I have to repent daily. I have to forgive others. I have to go to church. I have to attend small group. I have to serve the local church. I have to give to the local church. I have to observe the Sabbath. Is anybody else getting exhausted? Right? And we apply this as our to-do list. And when we look at this list, is anything on this list bad? Is anything on this list not honorable and God-pleasing? See, this list is actually a list of good things. But when we attach it to our salvation or worse off, when we attach it to the salvation of others, we're taking away from the cross or we're adding to the cross. Circumcision has no bearing on anyone's salvation because of Christ. And if we look at this list, we should see the same thing. None of these items brings us closer to God and none of these things can save us. None of them can change the way that God actually views us. See, J.D. Greer says this in his book, Gospel. He's got a gospel prayer that says, In Christ, there's nothing I can do that would make you love me more, and nothing I have done that makes you love me less. Your presence and approval are all I need for everlasting joy. As you have been to me, so I will be to others. As I pray, I'll measure your compassion by the cross and your power by the resurrection. Nothing I can do to make him love me more, nothing I can do to make him love me less. Why? Because Christ is enough. Let's look back at that list. If we change just one word, if we change have to to get to, we get a little bit better picture of how grace works. We get a little bit better picture of the fact that with Christ in us, our perspective changes. We are free from the law, but we respond to the law because of the internal change that we're going through by the power of the Holy Spirit. We have the power to do right because we are no longer bound to our sinful nature. How awesome is that? It's worth noting that Paul doesn't only give the command to stop adding to the cross. He actually points out what we will lose when we do add to the cross. Let's look back at verses 2 through 5. It says, look, I, Paul, I say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, by faith, we ourselves eagerly wait for the hope of righteousness. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. 
Look closely at what is lost when the law is chosen over grace. When the law is chosen over grace, we lose four things. First, we lose our justification in Christ. Paul says clearly, if you accept circumcision, in other words, if you choose circumcision and you choose the law, Christ is of no advantage. What do you need Christ for? You're choosing the law. Christ has nothing to do with it if you choose circumcision in the law. He's pointing out the blunt truth that justification comes through Christ and through Christ alone. Christ is enough. We don't only lose our justification in Christ, we also lose our freedom in Christ. Look back at verse number three with me. It says, I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. See, the freedom we have in Christ that supersedes the cross or the, the law, it goes away when we choose the law. What Paul is reminding these people is that the law, the Old Testament law, it's not some buffet table that you can walk up to and pick and choose what you want and leave the rest of it for someone else to have. No, the law was designed to be kept in its entirety. All 613 commands that are in the law were designed to be kept in its entirety. Where does this lead? Well, it leads to condemnation. It leads to judgment. Because the law condemns. James 2.10 states that clearly. It says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Choose the law and you're choosing the yoke of slavery. Christ is enough. We'd only lose our justification and our freedom. We also lose our position in Christ. Verse number four, you are severed from Christ, you who would be justified by the law. You want to choose justification by the law? That's a completely different road. See, what Paul's pointing out here is that the road to justification, the road to heaven, the road to forgiveness, the road to a relationship with God is two different ways. You either go down the path of the law and keep it perfectly your whole life, or you go with Christ. And see, here's the, here's the beautiful thing, folks. There was a man who went down the road of the law to fulfill it so we could go behind him. And his name is Jesus Christ. The law was fulfilled by someone else and it was Jesus Christ. So that all we have to do is get behind him and follow him and fall on his coattails to get justified through what he did on the cross. We don't have to go through the law. And in fact, Jesus Christ and the law are two completely separate roads. And if you choose the law, you're severing yourself from Christ. They don't intermingle. Those roads do not crisscross. They are separate roads. Choose the road you want to go on. But we all know that the road of the law leads to condemnation. Christ is enough. We don't only lose our justification and our freedom in Christ or our position in Christ. We also lose our understanding of grace. Well, verse one is one of the mountains in this passage, right? Verse one is one of the mountains of the Bible, probably. Verse four may be the lowest of the low in this passage. You have fallen away from grace. Whoa. Now, it's important to highlight here that Paul isn't saying that you can lose your salvation. Like if you sin too much, you're falling away from grace. That gets misinterpreted quite often. That's not the case. Okay. If you've turned away from your sins and you've repented of your sins and you've, and you've received Christ as your savior, you cannot lose your salvation. You are going to heaven and we have confidence in that. Now, what Paul is saying here is he's highlighting that anyone who relies on the law cannot and has no reason to rely on grace. We have fallen away from, lost grasp of, lost sight of, or just plain lost an understanding of grace. John MacArthur says this about this passage. It says, Paul's clear meaning is that any attempt to be justified by the law is to reject salvation by grace alone through faith alone. Those once exposed to the gracious truth of the gospel who then turn their backs on Christ and seek to be justified by the law are separated from Christ and lose all prospects of God's gracious salvation. Their desertion of Christ and the gospel only proves that their faith was never genuine. We cannot add to grace. Grace doesn't share the, low, the road with salvation, of salvation with the law. Grace through Christ is our only ticket to eternity. Christ is enough. We've looked at two urgent warnings regarding our Christian freedom. The third urgent warning that we see in the text is do not get distracted 
by false teachers. Let's look at verse number seven. <clears throat> you are running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. I have confidence in the Lord that you will take no other view and the one who is troubling you will bear the penalty, whoever he is. But I, brothers, still preach circumcision. But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who unsettled you would emasculate themselves. Now, I can't help but point out that this section is, is, is kind of, it's like a rabbit trail. We kind of jump off course and then come back to this freedom in Christ. And it's just a small rabbit trail. I mean, it can be, it can be attached for sure, but it's here. So we need to talk about it. And I studied this and was like, how do I make the connection with this? I mean, Paul goes off on a rant right here is really what he does, right? And I stumbled across the commentator that explained that a lot of times these letters would actually be transcribed while someone was saying it orally, all right? So, so Paul presumably would have been speaking this. And as I've tried to do, probably not near well enough, I'm sure Paul is pretty worked up here if you read the tone of the message. So Paul is excited about this. He's drilling stuff home. And then all of a sudden, it's like someone came up to him and said, hey, Paul, you do realize that the Jewish teachers are saying that you are okay with circumcision through sal to salvation. This, the Jewish leaders are saying that you are in agreement with them. So he's like, all right, time out, detour, let's go. He's like, let's solve this right now. No time to let this sit and simmer. This needs to be addressed today. See, really what he's explaining to, him, to them is don't get distracted. Don't get distracted by these false teachers. And he uses the, you know, you were running well. He uses a, a sports analogies quite often, actually, Paul does. And I'm sure that we have all seen the funny videos of people who are running a race and get distracted, right? What happens? They fall, they run into some barrier, they, they lose, they, they trip, they, they, like it, it's, it's a mess. And it ends up on some fail video that we all sit and laugh at whenever we watch it. You know, our Christian walk isn't a whole lot different. Our Christian walk isn't a whole lot different because there's a lot of things that are vying for our attention in this world. There's a lot of things that are pulling our attention away from what we should be focused on, which is Christ. And I'm intrigued, quite frankly, at how often we have talked about false teachers lately. Is anybody else intrigued by that? Like, has anybody else caught that? You're intrigued, aren't you, buddy? Yeah, thanks. Looks like him and I are on the same page here. Um, we've talked about false teachers so much lately in our study through second Corinthians. And now again, we're seeing it in Galatians and I was tempted to say, all right, we've talked about this enough, but the reality is, is Paul continually talks about false teachers, about what they're saying, what they're doing, how to be aware of them, how to handle them, how to work with them, how to get them out of your congregation. He deals with false teachers all the time and how foolish of us to think that that no longer applies to us in today's day and age. I felt convicted or maybe a better word is just cautious about the false teachers that we may have in our modern era. You know, Paul clearly takes the time to address this. And, and let's be real, folks. Here at Hope Bible Church, we have been blessed with solid biblical teaching. And I would submit to you that false teachers don't always show up inside of your direct local church in today's day and age. False teachers may not even have a pulpit. False teachers may not even have any level of prominence within any church. Because remember, Paul is saying, these guys distracted you. These false teachers distracted you. What Paul is talking about is distractions. Could circumcision replace Christ? Or should it even be held on the same level of grace? Absolutely not. Is it bad? No. The list that we just had on the screen, is it bad? No. But it should be held on, should it be held on the same level as Christ and what he did on the cross? Never. See, I would even submit to you that some of the false teachers or the distractions that we face on a daily basis could actually be decent things that we're looking at or listening to or hearing. How about social media? 
How about the fact that I can log on to social media and find, and find 75 different versions of one verse, one word, one theology, one doctrine. I can get 75 different views and everybody's an expert. Folks, we need to be careful what we're putting in front of our eyes and what we're letting into our ears, the gates to our soul when it comes to God's word and what's being t- said to us. And I'm not saying this because we have kids that we need to be watching out for. I'm saying it because we need it. Can I make a confession to you guys? I can't watch the news anymore. The news makes me angry. I I have to limit my intake of the news. I have to limit what I actually know what's going on because I just get angry. And you know what? That's not a godly response. That's not a God honoring response. So I have to limit the intake because if I don't limit the intake, guess what happens? I get distracted. I start thinking about everything that's going on in the news when my mind should be focused on something else. Church, what's your distractions? Philosophers, teachers, well, intellectuals, authors, artists, politicians, athletes. The list goes on and on and on. What is your distraction? What could take your eyes off of the race that Christ has put before you? What could get you distracted enough to make you stumble? Paul finishes up this section with a good old fashioned defense statement and some hard hitting sarcasm. And this shouldn't catch us off guard because he did that all throughout second Corinthians as well. Let's read verses 11 and 12 together. He says, but if I brothers still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. I wish those who would unsettle you would just emasculate themselves. Now, Paul wasn't an attorney, but this is a pretty good defense statement because, see, Paul was getting persecuted over and over and over again. And he was getting persecuted because the gospel that he was teaching was an offensive gospel. It was the gospel of the cross and of Jesus Christ. And guess what? Today, that gospel is still offensive. Why? Because the gospel tells us that the cross shows us how just, how vile we are, how sinful we are. The cross is a mirror that reflects all of our indeficiencies before God. The cross is a flashlight that shines into our deepest, darkest moments of our life. The cross shows us that we have no control over our future, that we can't do anything to gain eternity with God. The cross is an offensive thing for us as as just humans because we have no control. It shows us everything that we've done wrong and gives us no hope on our own to do it. And all we're left with is to turn to the cross and put all of our hope in the cross and not the cross, folks, but the man that hung on that cross. Jesus Christ had to be brutally murdered because of me, because of Brody Thompson. My sins put him there. Church family, our sins put him there. The cross is offensive. And see, this is the the gospel that Paul was preaching to the churches. This is what Paul was speaking to the churches. And it was offensive to the Jewish leaders who had lived by the law their whole life. This was offensive. So Paul's saying, hey, listen, just get this through your minds. If I'm saying that circumcision in the law is the way to salvation, then why would I be preaching an offensive gospel that is getting me persecuted? That makes no sense. Mic drop. And then he he doesn't stop there, though. He says, he gets really just sarcastic and blurts out, I wish they would just emasculate themselves. If they think that the cutting of the flesh is going to save them, cut it all off. Pretty crazy, huh? The message of the cross is offensive, and Paul makes the clear statement that if he too agreed with this circumcision, there would be no reason for his, his persecution. Church, we are so blessed to be able to live in a country that is free. We have the freedom culturally to share the gospel of the cross. And we don't experience probably near the persecution that Paul did. We have the freedom to share the fact that Christ is enough. Is anybody getting the intensity at which Paul was writing this letter yet? Do you hear this? Do you see this? You see his frustration, his sarcasm, his defensiveness. He's going at it. Why? Because he loved the church. 
because he loved the church. He loved the people. Let this be both an encouragement and a challenge to you folks. Paul loved the church so much that he was so passionate in his writings to make sure that there was nothing that could be confused about the gospel. Let us, let us respond the same way. Does the gospel move us and our love for the church? Do we have a passion for God's people like we are witnessing here in Paul? And we've gone through three urgent warnings regarding our Christian freedom. Stand firm, stop adding to the cross, and do not get distracted by false teachers. Realizing Paul's love for the church that is so clearly displayed in his passionate writing leads us to our fourth and final urgent warning. Do not abuse your freedom. Grace, do not abuse it. Look back at verse number 13 with me. For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. I love this, that Paul uses freedom as the bookends to this portion of the message, right? He says, for freedom Christ has set us free. And he circles back around and in a loving, brotherly way, he even uses the term brothers. He says, for you were called to freedom, brothers. He then gives this final urgent warning of this portion. He says, do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. Do not use your freedom as an opportunity to take advantage of grace. Don't abuse grace. And this isn't the only time we hear this urgent warning actually in scripture. See, Paul talks about grace and the power it has over the law in Romans. And as he finishes up that section in Romans chapter number six, he then explains how we should be responding to this, how we should be responding based off of our actions and reactions. It says this in verse 15 of Romans chapter number six, what then are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace by no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey either of sin, which leads to death or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Christian, we don't use our freedom as a license to continue in sin. We don't use our ticket to eternity as an excuse to sin in the present. We don't abuse the grace that has been given to us. Paul uses this concept of slavery again, slavery again and points out that, hey, you're either a slave to the law and the yoke of slavery that comes with the flesh and sin, or you're gonna be so moved from the inside out that people who view, view you will think you're a slave to your righteousness. People will think that that's exactly what you're traveling around and traveling over towards because you were either a slave to the devil and a slave to the lawless lifestyle, or you are a slave to righteousness. Why do we do all this? Because it leads to sanctification. It leads to our growth in our walk with Christ. Because of our commitment to our freedom from sin, we can then experience growth in our walk with Christ and are becoming more like him through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul then closes this awesome portion of scripture with a practical marker, and I love this. I love when there's a practical application. There's a lot of teaching here, but there's also an application. Breaking free from the urgent warnings, he lets us know that true Christian freedom is measured by our love. Our love for each other, our love for our neighbors, our love for the church. Look back at verse 13. For you were called to freedom, brothers, only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. Love and serve one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. He's basically saying, hey, you churches, all of you, listen, 
this backbiting, this bickering, this legalism, this finger pointing, all this has got to stop. Because if it doesn't stop, it's going to lead to your destruction. You're going to bite and devour each other. You've got to love each other. And this isn't the first time he actually mentioned it. If you look back up at verse number six, it says, towards the end of verse six, it says, but only faith working through love. Circumcision counts for nothing. Only faith working through love does. Our faith works through love. Our love shows our faith. You can't have faith without love. When we are set free from our sins, when we are set free from the tyranny of our sins and the tyranny of the law, we should be overcome with a love for others. One of the ways I've seen this practically played out here at Hope is the, is the ways that people have stepped up to help serve in different areas of the church. To see all the faces that are serving in children's, to see all the faces that are serving in worship and out on the parking lot and the ushers and the greeters and the welcome team and the people behind the counter serving us donuts and coffee and my, and my awesome youth leaders, I gotta plug them too, and anybody else that I missed that is serving in this church, it's so encouraging to see them play out their love for the church and their love for God practically by serving the church. Some of you here may be feeling convicted may be the wrong word, but led to actually apply your gifts. You know, we still need help in our worship team. We still need help in our children's team. And I believe that God works through people that are sitting right here and works on their hearts to grow within them a love that is so deep for the church that we just raise our hands and say, where do you need me? Some of you are gifted and we would love to have your giftings applied here at the church. And there's no greater way to show love for the church than to serve it. Paul uses the term brothers, an endearing term to show the type of brotherly love for the church. He's, he's saying, I'm in this with you guys. I'm, I'm alongside you. I want you to succeed. I don't want this confusion for you. And listen, if you want to follow the law, if the law is your focus, look at verse 14. I'll give you the answer to the law. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If you just love people, it's going to be a whole lot easier to keep the law. If the law is what you're concerned about, love people. Love people. Legalism divides. It judges. It condemns. The law is an external motivator that puts pressure on us to respond. It puts pressure on us to change the way that we are doing our life. It puts pressure on us and puts the decision-making on us to make the changes ourselves. Grace, our freedom in Christ, changes us from the inside out. It's an internal motivator. Grace loves and should bring the bride of Christ, the church, closer together. It forgives Grace is an internal motivator. It motivates from the inside. It changes the way we think and view others. Grace causes us to want to follow Christ with the power of the Holy Spirit inside of us. As the worship team comes up, earlier we talked about the freedoms that we have here. Freedom of religion, freedom of speech, freedoms that we get to experience and get to celebrate every 4th of July. In 1941, President Franklin Roosevelt shared the freedoms he wanted to see after the war was over. He hoped that one day all people would get to experience and enjoy four different freedoms. Freedom of worship, freedom of speech, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. Warren Wiersbe said it best in one of his comments, our world needs one more freedom, a fifth freedom. Man needs to be free from himself and the tyranny of his sinful nature. Is that you today? Do you need to experience that freedom? Are you wanting that freedom that many of us in here have experienced? And that's why we come back here and why we love each other and why we worship. Is Christ working on your heart to experience that freedom today? If that's the case, there's gonna be people up here standing ready to pray with you after service. They would love to talk more about that with you. Christians, we learned four urgent warnings today. Stand firm in your freedom. Stand firm, be careful because your tendency is, gonna go back to this, is to go back to that legalistic law type lifestyle. Do not add to the cross. Don't do it. Don't be legalistic. We get to do, we don't have to do. Don't get distracted by false teachers. And obviously the last one, do not abuse your freedom or your grace. Church, embrace the Christian freedom, embrace grace. Let that fuel you from the inside out and may the love of Christ grow within us all. Christ is enough. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you and praise you so much for your word. 
We thank you so much for freedom that we have in you. Lord, without Christ, we have nothing. Without Christ, we have no way of making a relationship with you, Lord. And you knew that before the foundations of the earth, and we're so thankful for that. Lord, would we not only experience that or or celebrate that once every year or even a couple months, but Lord, would we live in the power of that freedom on a daily basis? Lord, would we be moved by that freedom to share it with others? Would we be moved by that freedom to love the church and others well? Lord, if there's anybody here that's wrestling with the idea of freedom that has not accepted your free gift of eternal life, Lord, would you just move in their heart right now? And would they come to know you? Lord, we just lift you up in your son's name. Amen. Thank you.